I know people are coming on. Um, I'm a managing director at ITM 21st, and I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedule to attend today's session, Insurance for Trust Real Estate Assets, All You Need to Know. I hope that everybody had a great vacation at some point over the summer and during our break, and now that the kids are back at school and we're heading into the fourth quarter, we're happy to be back with our first session of the fall season. First of all, some housekeeping. A copy of the PowerPoint and the handout for this session is on our website. You should have received it in the reminder, but if not, if you do not have it, you can go to www.itm21st.com, that's itm21st.com, click on Education, then on Today's Session where you will find the handbook. Also there will be a CE attendee form there. It's in the blue box at the bottom of the page. You can click on the form to download it, and there are directions for sending it back. The form is for both CFP and CTFA, and this session has also been approved for CE for both of those designations. And also, we're happy to be able to provide CE for members of FIRMA, the Fiduciary and Investment Risk Management Association. So if you want to get to CE, just go to the website, fill out the form according to the directions, and send it in. You will notice that you have the ability to ask questions along the way by typing them in. If you do have a question, please do ask it. If important at the time, I will stop and ask our speaker. If not, we will bring it up to the end. But please do reach out if you have any questions. We've had a great sign-up numbers for our next sessions, and I wanted to take a minute to let you know what we have coming up. In a couple of weeks, Aaron Hansen, who ends up our mediation department and I are doing a session that will discuss how totally trustees can avoid getting sued. Quite frankly, this session grew out of real life situations we have seen where trustees have put themselves in a position of liability. And if you manage life insurance, there are a number of traps that you can fall into. And it's not just letting a policy lapse. We're going to walk through your responsibilities as a totally trustee and show the real life cases where we have found liability or possible liability and how you can avoid these situations going forward. If you manage life insurance, you should attend. Randy Popple will be here on August 13th. Randy has provided us with a number of very well attended and very well received sessions. And this one is no different. The sign up numbers are big for this particular se session. He will be discussing discretionary distributions, a subject that many of you have requested, and we're looking forward to that session. Randy always does a great job. On November 1st, Aaron and I will be back to talk about what to do with an unwanted life insurance policy. These days, with the estate tax law changes, many grantors believe that they may not need their policy anymore. And this is going to kind of go back to our first session on liability, our next session, because as a trustee, you are still responsible to maximize the value of the policy. So what should you do with a policy if the grantor is no longer going to fund it or tells you to surrender it? I've seen trustees simply do as the grantor requested, which is a big, big mistake. We will walk you through the options and help you to develop a prudent process around dealing with this asset, one that could be worth hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. But today, we're happy to have Judy Altman, Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager at PDS Companies, which is a, a great partner with us on these sessions. Judy joined PDS in April of 2015 as the manager for all of the specialty asset portfolio, and she manages all specialty assets that are in the trust, including real estate, notes and mortgages, oil and gas, closely held farm and ranch assets. Prior to joining PDS, Judy worked as a consultant for a large trust company, helping them answer OCC findings relating to their processes and procedures. Judy previously worked for Bank of America for over 33 years. She has a Bachelor's of Art degree in elementary education from the State University of New York at Cortland. She also has a professional designation in bank management from the University of California, Los Angeles. Judy has also attended the Cannon Trust School for Trust Administration. As I said, we're very, very happy to have Judy with us today. I look forward to her session. So take it away, Judy. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it.
Hi everyone, welcome to Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Insurance, the Trust Real Estate Assets But Were Afraid to Ask. Several years ago, and for several years in my previous position, I did an insurance roadshow called, you guessed it, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Insurance But Were Afraid to Ask. This roadshow was presented to trust officers, investment officers, financial advisors, and real estate asset ma managers, along with the insurance broker who handled the blanket insurance for the trust portfolio. We traveled around California, Washington, Arizona, Nevada, providing this information to the administration folks. So whether you're dealing with a blanket insurance policy or individual policies for your trust assets, I'm going to tell you right off the bat what I feel are the four biggest takeaways that hopefully you're going to have after listening to this webinar. First one is going to be, what does the insurance policy say? And you're going to hear me say or mention these things numerous times during the presentation. So what does the insurance policy say? What's in the small print? Do you know about any exclusions from that particular policy? Second thing is, the trust needs to be either the named insured or an additional insured on that policy. Third thing, always ask the insurance agent about specifics of any policy. That's their job, that's what they get paid for. Lastly, if you're handling the more complex assets, make sure you use subject matter experts in that area. So I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to just read off, I like to talk off the cuff, but I do want to read off the definitions that you'll be hearing me talking about for property, liability, earthquake, flood, wind, and workers' compensation. So property insurance is a policy that provide, provides financial reimbursement to the owner or renter of a structure and its contents in the event of damage or theft. Property insurance can also include homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance, flood insurance, earthquake insurance. Personal property is generally covered on a homeowner's or renter's policy unless it's of a particularly high value and in that case you would be purchasing an addition to the policy called a rider. Now you're going to hear me talking about scheduled items but it's the same thing. If a claim is filed, the property insurance policy will either reimburse the policy owner for the actual value of the damage or the replacement cost to remedy the damage. Replacement cost is another key word you're going to hear me talk about. Liability insurance for, is any type of insurance policy that protects an individual, or in some cases a business, from the risk that they may be sued and held legally liable for something such as malpractice, injury, or negligence. Liability insurance policies cover both legal costs and any legal payouts for which the insured would be responsible if they were found legally liable. Intentional damage, contractual liabilities are typically not covered on, under these policies. Now liabilities insurance, we're talking about being a trustee in a fiduciary capacity. Liability insurance is very important. Any homeowner who uh, should always be carrying liability insurance for their home. I'll give you lots of examples later on. Business owners may purchase liability insurance that covers them if an employee is injured during business operations. More about that later. Here are some examples of protections that a homeowner's liability coverage can provide. I'll talk about other liability insurance for the other type of real estate assets later in the presentation. One thing you want to have covered if someone's hurt on your property, if someone is hurt or injured on your property and the injury results in their inability to work, you may be found legally liable for the wages that they lose as a result. Liability coverage may help prevent you from paying out of pocket in a situation like this. Death benefits. Of course, nobody wants to think that the possibility of someone having a fatal accident in his or her home, but it's something you want you can't exclude. The average home liability policy can also cover death benefits of the family of someone who meets an untimely end as the result of an accident in your home or in your property. But again, there's takeaway number two, you check the insurance policy. 
legal costs. If you're sued following an accident in your home, you may need a lawyer. Liability coverage will help cover your legal expenses regardless of whether you're found responsible for damages. There might be coverage away from the home. Liability coverage may also cover you for damages that stem from accidents that happen to you when you're away from the home. For instance, for instance, if you accidentally cause damage to your hotel's lobby, this coverage may help protect you if the hotel company seeks reimbursement. We're going to talk about and see pictures of earthquake uh, incidences. Earthquake insurance is a form of property insurance that pays the policy owner in the event of an earthquake that causes damages to the property. Most ordinary homeowners insurance policies do not cover earthquake damage. It's going to be a separate policy. The de deductibles are pretty high, but again, check with your insurance agent. Floods. Now when I read this, I could not believe it. Would you believe that floods are the number one natural disaster in the United States? You don't have to live in a high-risk flood zone to be affected by a flood. Floods and flash floods can occur anywhere, even in the desert. Just an inch of water can cause damage to your property. In fact, in the U.S., flood-related losses cost people more than a billion, that's with a B, dollars a year. You might want to be looking into windstorm insurance. That's a special type of insurance and casualty insurance that's designed to, come to, cover, to cover damages caused by high winds. Windstorm insurance may cover damages from hurricane, force winds, tornadoes, hail, and other weather events that may accompany, be accompanied by wind gusts that exceed 35 miles per hour. Workers' comp, I'll be getting into this a lot in a, in a little bit, but it's a form of insurance providing wage replacement and medical benefits to employees injured in the course of employment in exchange for mandatory relinquishment of the employee's right to sue his or her employee for negligence. We'll be talking at the end about perils. It's probable cause, such as earthquake, fire, theft, we're going to talk about beetles later on that exposes an asset to injury or loss and against which the insurance policy is purchased. So what are we going to talk about today? We, I started talking a little bit about residential. I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. I'm going to talk about commercial, industrial property, farm, ranch, timber. Because you can have any of these assets as assets in your trust. So, for example, let's start talking about property coverage on a home on the residential side. The trust, as I said earlier, one of your takeaways, the trust must be named as the insured or the additional insured on that insurance policy. You're going to see an insurance policy. The first page is going to be the declaration page, and it's going to show your coverages. It's going to show the time period that that insurance policy covers. So here's one of your takeaways, getting the trust named as the insured or the additional insured. Now a lot of insurance brokers, the, the smaller brokers, might or usually don't even know about a mortgagee. All they know about, or excuse me, know about a trust owning a property. All they know about is a mortgagee as being named as an additional insured. You might have to explain to the broker the trust's ownership of the home. I've had to send copies of the recorded deed showing the ownership of the name of, in the bank of ABC Bank as trustee for the, let's say, Altman Trust. Or once I even had to send the front page of the trust document that showed who the trustee for the trust was. Now looking at the cartoon, and this is not a flood that you would buy extra flood insurance, but you've got the guy talking to his wife saying, instead of fixing the basement, let's convert it into an indoor pool. Of course, if the flooding came from outside, that's another story. But this could be something, a water pipe breaking within the house. That's going to be covered under your property coverage. And of course, you've got the guy running off with your computer representing theft of items inside the home. So, when you're talking about replacement costs, you're talking about, it's a term that refers to one of the two primary valuation methods for establishing the value of the insured 
property for purposes of determining the amount the insurer will pay in the event of a loss. And that's we're talking about your insurance premium. The other primary valuation method is actual cash value, but I'm not going to get into that. So it's usually defined in the policy as the cost to replace the damaged property with materials of like kind and quality without any deduction for depreciation. And this is what the premium for the property coverage is based on. So looking at this slide right now, you've got uh, one of the tools that I know insurance brokers use is, is the Marshall and Swift tool. You can have, it takes into a lot of consideration, location, zip code. You might have a house that you're building in Beverly Hills, California. You're building the same exact house in Riverside, California. It's probably going to cost more expensive building that home in Beverly Hills. So that's a tool that an insurance broker is going to use when determining the replacement cost. Now again, I took this, this slide from an appraisal, and I'm not going to go into appraisals and how you determine values, but you want to look at the section called the cost approach. And that's, and what I highlighted in the middle is the total estimate of cost new. So if this home that, that I had gotten an appraisal on, in today's dollars burnt down to the ground, the insurance policy would pay almost $597,000. Now, you want to make sure that when you're looking at insurance policies that the home is insured for at least 100% of, of its estimated replacement cost. Now, if you don't have a current appraisal, you could always hire a professional rep replacement cost appraiser, where, and they are a good source for obtaining an estimated replacement cost of the home. Now, as I said earlier, that insurance premium is mostly based on that value that the insurance broker determines. And so you always want to make sure that the replacement cost for that insurance policy is that value. It's never the full value or even the tax value that you might see. And I've honestly, I've seen some policies where the replacement cost was higher than the market value. So it, it, again, it depends on what's being insured in the home. If you're doing a remodel, make sure you let the agent know that there were upgrades because that premium will increase. Now here are some examples. Well, everybody's got a goofy in their life, but you've got what you need to have liability insurance. I'm just showing you a couple of incidences and it blew me away when I saw on that third the slide all the way to the right, you could actually those folks where you're worried about people coming up the steps covered with ice or snow, you could see you could get heated step warmers or you know whatever that is to get rid of and to protect anybody walking up the steps onto your home. Of course there are a lot of other issues. You're walking up the steps within my house. I would want that my liability insurance would be covering and protecting the trust in that respect. Now this was an interesting picture, and I remember it was part of the, the uh, Master Trust program, but again, you'd probably want to read the small print. You might have a client who is keeping paint, other flammable liquids in their garage. Now this is obviously a picture of something exploding within the garage, and it could have caused some sort of environmental cloud or issue that affected your neighbors. So this is where your insurance policy, you want to make sure that something, if this situation happens, you'd want to make sure it's covered. And I didn't want to put a picture of a piece of vacant land, but even having a, a lot, for example, a vacant lot either anywhere or in the middle of a city, a residential lot in the city, you want to make sure you've got your liability insurance in place a child or anybody walking by falling in the lot, this is where your liability insurance is going to come in. Now I remember when I used to do the insurance roadshow with the broker, he would always tell everyone, now remember the policy is not going to co cover the mysterious disappearance of the Rolex watch. So schedule items could be jewelry, artwork, antiques. Always have, when, when you want to, when you are aware of these 
assets, they're listed as assets of the trust. You know you walk into the client's home and you see, we should all have uh, one of Monet's um, water lilies painting in our home, but you could also be looking at a lot of pieces of antique furniture. So you will always, and if they're part of the trust, you always want to have an appraisal and you want to schedule, that should show them as a scheduled item on that homeowner's policy. I remember visiting a winery in uh, Northern California. So the winery was a trust asset and on this winery uh, was a home that was obviously in the family for many, many generations and the current generation was using it. Well, we walk into the home and my mouth fell on the floor. Every place I looked looked like a very, very expensive piece of antique jewelry. I saw a beautiful Bible on an ornate stand, family Bible. I don't know, it could have been worth a lot of money. Guess what my first call was when I guess got back to the office? Hello, trust officer. I just went into so-and-so's house. Do we have every single thing in that house scheduled because it all looked very old and very expensive. Now, you're, when we are talking about additional insurance for your properties, you're going to worry about earthquakes. You might be in a flood zone. You, you need to be aware of where your properties are, although you heard me earlier say that you didn't have, the home didn't necessarily have to be in a listed flood zone because a small amount of water could do a tremendous amount of, value, of damage. But there are limits and when, when you're considering these separate policies and the du deductibles are usually a lot higher than what the normal deductibles would be for a homeowner's policy. So if you're purchasing these type of insurance, make sure you understand the cost and what the deductible might be. Hold on for a second while I take a sip of water. So you got a trust and the trust is hiring employees who are, let's say, a caregiver taking care of the, uh, your trust door who's living in that trust home. So you want to make sure that there is workers' compensation insurance for any of those employees hired in the trust working in the home. Now, if you've got a caregiver or someone else, a nurse, someone else who's coming on a regular basis to that home, you want to make sure they're hired through an agency. And of course, the main question to ask the agency is you, that they do have workers' comp insurance for their employees. But you also might have the trust doors who are paying people under the table. They're not you know, going to the trust. This is the call that the trust officer should be making. Does the trust document say that the trust should be taking care of this type of expense? Then you need to insist that the trust be making the payments, taking out the appropriate deductions for that employee, and of course getting the workers' comp insurance for that employee. The work, the gardener, the um, pool person coming onto the property, you want to make sure that the company that you're hiring is going to cover those employees for any kind of workers' comp, any kind of injury that they might sustain. You want their liability insurance policy to cover their workers. I remember there was a situation where there was a caregiver who, had, um, who was taking her client, the trustor, an elderly gentleman, in her car to a doctor's appointment and the gentleman did something, I can't remember what it was, but did something that caused a accident. So number one, the personal liability insurance for that trust door living in the home would cover that situation. And of course the workers' comp, if, if that caregiver was hurt, the workers' comp insurance would cover any injuries that they sustained. Now you also want where people are who are listening, you're all over the country. You need to check your state laws. I was told recently, I'm in Texas, and I was told that workers' comp insurance is not necessarily required, but you better have a pretty high personal liability policy in place. But again, remember your takeaways. You talk to your insurance agent about any questions. They'll know about state-specific requirements. 
Now, it doesn't hurt to have an umbrella liability policy. I know what there was the blanket insurance policy for the trust assets that I worked with, but there and it was a pretty high dollar amount just for the blanket. But there was also an umbrella liability policy in place. And I remember many years ago, my, my own parents had a liability insurance policy, and there was a situation that it was good that they had it. So the umbrella liability policy is a personal liability policy designed to protect against catastrophic losses. Generally, an umbrella liability coverage will kick in when the liability limits of the other insurance have been reached. So again, if you've got a blanket insurance program for all of your assets, you should probably have an umbrella. If, you got if you've got individual policies, talk to the agent. Find out what the cost would be for an umbrella to having a rec a, an umbrella liability policy. It's a good thing to have. Next slide are the condos. Now, the trust needs to do a couple of things, or a trust officer or your asset manager. You need to be doing a couple of things. You need to look at the homeowner's policy for the complex, the homeowner's association's insurance policy, because that's going to tell you what's covered by the homeowner's policy. You're walking, uh, the homeowner's association's policy. You're walking around that pool and you trip and fall or something happens in the common area. That's going to cover, uh, that's going to be covered by the homeowners association's policy. But if you're coming into my unit and there's something that causes you to have an accident, you need to have, or the, the trust needs to have the homeowners insurance for the inside of the condo. And basically it's from the studs in where if that condo complex burnt down to the ground, the homeowners association policy would cover rebuilding of the building itself, but everything inside from the studs in, the carpets, the countertops, the appliances, everything that's inside, that's what the homeowner needs to have coverage for. So um, if you have, oh, another really good thing to mention to your clients is having special assessment insurance. It's a really good idea. I heard about it when I was living in California, and I made sure I had it when I had a condo in LA, and then when I moved to Texas, I made sure I got it. And it was perfect having it because I bought an older townhouse. The roofs, it was getting close to 30 years since the complex had been built, and we were going to be replacing the roofs, and that was a special assessment for uh, the roof replacement. So having the special assessment insurance saved me personally a lot of money. So definitely look into that with your insurance brokers. You might have income property, homes or even condos that you're renting out, income producing properties. So of course you can have all the other type of insurance that we talked about. But you also want to have for your tenant, you want them to have renter's insurance and you actually want to put it in the lease application so that it's right up front that if you're going to lease this property from me, that we are, or the trust, you are required to have renter's insurance and you need to let us know because we're going to want the the trust to be named as the additional insured. We're obviously not going to be the named insured, that's going to be your tenant, but the trust is going to be the additional insured. So now you've got vendors, contractors coming onto the property. I wrote large property improvement projects, but you know what, even if with the smaller ones, you want to make sure that the person who's coming on, you've got your trust clients, you're of course talking to them, telling them, who's coming on, giving them the information, and you want to give them insurance assurances that you've picked the right people to come on to, your property, to the property to do whatever needs to be done. But especially on your larger projects, the vendor, the contractor, you want to have proof of a current liability insurance policy. And if it's a large project, you want the trust to be named an additional insured 
on that contractor's liability policy just for the time period that it's going to take for them to do to have that project completed. You want to get proof that there's current workers' compensation insurance for their employees. Do they have current licenses? Did anyone do an auto? Is there auto coverage for their vehicles or trucks? Biggie on this one, background checks. Who should be doing them? I'm PDS on behalf of my clients. I'm working with a national vendor who will do the vetting of all of the contractors, companies that I have that I'm hiring going on to my trust properties. But if you don't have someone like this and if you're doing your own contacting vendors to get them to work on home remodeling or any major project or even minor, you need to make sure that the questions or the, the items that I just mentioned are in place. Also, this is a new one that came up recently, although I knew about it when I was dealing with a master program. If a home is vacant or the trustor, the trustor dies or has been moved into a nursing home, what does the insurance policy say about a vacancy? I remember on the blanket policy, the deductible was double, but then I've heard recently about policies that are going to be canceled. So the, the point is, is um, asking the insurance agent and, of course, having the trust named as the insured or the additional insured. Now, in your handout, you've got an article about this adorable dog named Winnie the Pooh. Now, read the le article later, but bottom line, a lady set up a trust to take care of Winnie the Pooh after she died. So. Again, the, the guardian, the trust set up a guardian who was going to take care of Winnie the Pooh, and the guardian was annoyed at the trustee, annoyed to the point that I think a lawsuit, and I haven't read the trust document, so I don't know anything about that, but obviously it got enough uh, publicity for, some, for an article to be written. So when I read the article, I took it a step further, knowing you know, what I know about insurance for a trust asset. And by the way, the article says Winnie or pets are considered personal property. Who knew? But anyway, my mind went to, let's say that trust set, set out the home that the guardian was going to live in and the, the trust owned the home. Everything that I just talked about, make sure that you have that coverage. And also, what if Winnie bites somebody? I would want to make sure there's liability coverage. I'm not sure where it would be listed on the insurance policy, but again, that would be certainly a good question. I don't know if Winnie is a beneficiary. Again, I haven't read it. I'm not going into that. I'm just saying, what if? So that's enough for the residential stop side. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the commercial real estate. Like I talked about before, you want to get your replacement cost coverage, your property coverage from your appraisal or, of course, the insurance broker. And again, you're dealing with more complex uh, assets, so you're going to want to have the subject matter experts handling and answering any questions that you might have. One of the biggest takeaways when I was talking to and, and working with commercial properties was the lease. So you're the, the trust is the landlord. We own the property, whether it's a commercial, uh, commercial building downtown Dallas or a strip shopping center, whatever. You're going to have a lease and you're going to have tenants in the lease. So one of the important things that you as the landlord want to have would be the loss of rent as part of your policy. Now, the tenant's lease is going to dictate what the landlord or the trust is responsible for and what the tenant is responsible for. Now, I really don't want to go into when you talk about landlord's insurance versus tenants. I'm not going to go into great detail in talking about a triple net lease where the landlord has got liability, the tenant covers everything else, or if there's a single net lease, all I'm saying is you want to make sure that the trust is named as an additional insured and be, and be very clear on what your insurance for as the landlord, as the owner of the property is covering. Is it the roof, just the exterior part, the structure? Again, make sure you ask the questions. You want to make sure that the tenant has at least $1 million in their liability policy. 
There could be different coverages or different requirements according to the lease of a small tenant versus a large tenant. Tenants, they should know this, but they should have loss of business. And as I said earlier, the landlord should, of course, have loss of rent. Now, things happen. You've got to have your liability insurance. Now, I don't know if you can see, um, now, before I go into the, to this, the pictures, in the lease, the, it should state or it should be required that the tenant's liability policy should be the first line of defense of any claims being filed before the trust liability policy gets involved. Now, here's where as a uh, person who's managing that property or your real estate people, let's say something like that was not even part of the original lease or the tenant wants to make some changes or renegotiate the lease, this is the perfect opportunity, the perfect time where if the insurance wasn't covered originally in the lease, here's the opportunity to make sure fire and liability or any other casualty insurance would be covered in their lease. So now let's talk about a couple of examples, tripping and falling, let's say in a parking lot. You probably can't see closely that that um, picture in the upper left-hand corner, but you got to. There looks like a lot of cracks in the concrete. It looks like somebody on a bike was had an accident or near the drainage area. So again, who's responsible? Is it the landlord or is it the tenant? You've got people falling in shopping centers. You've got people falling on the ice outside. Just really, really important to know who's insurance is going to cover if these situations come up. I've got a really unbelievable story of an apartment building in Los Angeles. It was owned by the trust and obviously the trust officer wasn't maintaining it but hired a, a maintenance or a property management company. But in, at one evening, uh, part of the lighting in the parking structure was out and unfortunately a woman was attacked in the garage. Well, guess who she sued? She sued the trust because the trust should have maintained that property and made sure that the lights were on. So again, your liability insurance is so, so important. Now the type of insurance that a tenant gets should be specific to the type of business that's being conducted. Let's say, and we have this in Texas, you've got a car dealership and tremendous amount of hail damage that, that could happen to the car sitting in that lot. I remember I was in California during the Northridge earthquake and again a trust owned a car dealership. I couldn't find any pictures, I was trying to find pictures of that, but you wouldn't believe the pictures of what that earthquake did to the cars that were totally destroyed mostly every single car that was in that lot. Now the next one, I was Googling earthquake damage. I honestly have no idea how the yacht got up there, but it didn't look like the picture was photoshopped and it's a picture when you Google earthquake damage. You know, it's, it's amazing. Those of you who've been through earthquakes and have seen the damages or if you haven't been through one, but you've seen the damages, it's, it's unbelievable. So earthquake damage is expensive, especially if you're going to an insurance carrier after there might have been a recent earthquake in the area. But it's certainly an important uh, decision that you need to make. Now this one, um, everybody of course knows what happened in Dallas uh, at the end of July. And I was talking to a friend of mine who manages commercial properties here in Texas and she was aware of some, well, there could be an insurance policy and let's say the trust owns a commercial property. Now that bottom picture shows the five square blocks of downtown Dallas that were closed for three days. That was the crime scene. No one went to work. No businesses could be conducted in any of the office buildings. The tenants, the, the vendors, the Starbucks at the bottom of the office buildings, none of them could run their businesses because for three days 
there was no one was allowed in. Now, of course, terrorism is not going to be covered on any insurance policy that I know of, but a hate crime could be. And what my friend was telling me was that there are a lot of discussions with the various insurance companies that might have stated hate crime in their insurance policy and somebody, there were insurance claims being filed. Now, do you really want a fireworks factory? They're making the fireworks. Do you really want that as a trust asset? Now, you might not have a choice. It might already be in the trust. You might already have a gas station that's already in the trust. My point being is that there is insurance for these type of assets and you need to make sure that the appropriate insurance is covering these assets. And of course, what's our takeaway? The trust is, is the named insured for that property. We've got Additional coverages for lightning striking, flood, hurricanes. Whose insurance is going to cover for these, these perils? Is it the landlord who's covering the building and the tree fell down in front of that strip shopping center and caused damage? Or is it the tenant's responsibility? So you just need to be aware that there are these additional coverages that are out there and it's a good idea to be talking to your insurance agent to know what should be covered for your trust asset. So now let's go on to a more idyllic picture of a farm. Now the farm, of course, we talked about liability. We talked about property coverage. You certainly want to have replacement costs, uh, insurance, property coverage for those barns, for the silos, for the work sheds. You want to have if the, the trust owns the farm or if there's a tenant that's running that farm, they want to, you want to see if they've looked into crop insurance. Uh, is there, who's covering that crop insurance? Is the trust named as an additional insured under those policies? The tenant's got liability policy. Um, is the trust named or the trust should be named as the additional insured? You've got irrigation equipment or any farm equipment that's associated with that farm. That stuff's expensive. So you want to make sure that your insurance policy is going to cover anything. It's very costly, but you want to make sure you have the insurance to cover the replacement of any of this equipment. You also might be wanting to look into or your, your tenant, but again, it's your insurance agent for farms. What's the cost of the drought insurance? Now this one, I just thought was like, all right, now you're hearing the New York accent, but I've been here for a while and I've learned that you could actually have an oil well in the middle of a wheat field. So here's a picture and here's another couple of pictures of this oil well in the middle of a wheat field. So the, the, the farm is a trust asset. It's an income producing asset. And we also have a working interest in this oil well. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the different ownership interests, but if there's a working interest that the trust has, we want to make sure that the operator of that well has, number one, they've got to have liability insurance because anything happening or damage being done by that well, we want that operator's liability insurance to be that first line of defense. And of course, you want to make sure that the trust is named as the additional insured on that well to that property. Okay, we've got ranches. I'm not going to repeat again, but you've got structures. You've got to cover them for property. You've got people coming onto the property for liability. Cattle, you want to make sure your cattle are covered, they're covered, I was told, under the property coverage. That bottom right picture, I think it's the uh, Ewing Ranch from the TV show Dallas. If you ever come to Dallas, you got to go. It's a museum. It's a great thing to see, even though it's kind of, you know, it was, it was a great TV show. I liked it. So. You've got your cows on your farm. You've got your dairy cows, the upper left. You've got your beef cows, 
in the upper right. And because I am a Texan, I just had to put the longhorns in there. But they're not really used for the beef as much as the cows in the upper right-hand corner. Don't forget, those cows are coming in under their protected or covered under the property coverage. Now, when you're talking about liability, and this could be liability of people coming on your ranches, and we'll talk about timber in a minute, but you've got people coming onto the property. You might be allowing Homer's Hunting Club to come onto your property. You want to make sure that that hunting club has a liability policy covering their members and anything that happens that or their members might cause on that property. Of course, you're going to have your own liability policy for the ranch. And this is specialized insurance, so there's your other takeaway. Make sure you ask the insurance agent and make sure you have the appropriate, the appropriate coverage. If you've got someone coming onto that ranch to hunt, you want to make sure they are not part of a hunting club, that they sign a waiver or a save and hold harmless agreement. But it's not going to protect you totally because there still could be some liability uh, to the homeowner or to the owner of that ranch. If there are people doing trial trail rides on the property, you could get something that's called equine insurance. Last but not least, you could have timber assets. I was talking to a coworker who I used to work with, and he said there are a lot of trusts who are interested, uh, trustors, settlers, wanting to buy timber to diversify their real estate portfolio. And so there are, so you could have timber in your portfolio. Now, you, insurance is tricky, not really tricky. You just need to make sure that you've got named peril insurance that would cover your fire, your lightning, any damage done by hail or wind. If there is an, if there are any structures in that land that are used in the in the business of running that timber, you want to make sure that that's covered. You want to look into crop insurance for that standing timber. If anyone is coming onto that property doing for hunting things that we just took talked about for ranches, it would be the same thing. You would want to make sure that you've got your liability issues taken care of, whether you're hunting on a ranch or hunting on timber property. Any logging or equipment, you want to make sure that there's insurance for any equipment that, be used, that would be used in managing and maintaining that property. Now, my second to last slide is just heartbreaking. I was talking to the insurance broker who I worked with many years ago, and he's based in California, and he said, Judy, you wouldn't believe what's happening up in the northern, uh, the high Sierras in northern California. Because of the drought and because of a horrible beetle infestation, millions, millions of trees are being destroyed. And that left-hand side picture, every one of those brown, trees are dying or dead. And you can see there's very, very little green, alive trees in that area. I can't tell, I mean, it, that second slide on the right-hand side, it's tremendous damage. I could, I'm not going to describe it or anything, but it's obviously killing the trees. Now, when you want to have this type of insurance, to cover the beetles, to cover the drought. This is considered catastrophic or casualty insurance. And what my friend told me is right now, there's only one insurance underwriter that's actually writing insurance for these type of perils. But he was also saying it's encouraging that other insurance brokers are coming into the field and, and are writing or starting to write these top, uh, type of insurance policies. So hopefully that would reduce the cost of this type of insurance. Because his the big takeaway I had after talking to him was this type of insurance is very expensive. But when you're talking about, you know, if this is a major asset and you've got a, a lot of trees, you might want to, you know, consider, but again, talk to the experts. This is where your your math uh, your subject matter experts come into place. You might also have sublimits for wind, snow, and ice. 
So in summary, what does the policy say? Read and understand the insurance policy, even the small print. Always, always ask the insurance agent if, there, if you have any questions at all. The trust is to be named the insured or the additional insured on the policies. Well, something I forgot to mention, let's say Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith wants to be the named insured on their homeowner's insurance policy. That's fine. You just need to make them or have them understand and explain to the insurance agent that that's fine. Mr. Smith could be named as the insured, but ABC Bank as trustee for the Smith Family Trust is going to be named as the additional insured on that policy. And last but not least, work with subject subject matter experts in managing the more complex real estate assets. So that's it for me. Thank you all very much. And Michael, I'll turn it back to you. Judy, I have I have three questions to come in and they all kind of revolve around this additional insured. So um, it's interesting that you, you kind of ended on that note. Now, let me see if I understand. It, it, what is the difference between the insured and the additional insured? Is, is it they're both really the same, but because there's two parties, you're just listing it that way? Yeah, when you look at insurance policies, especially homeowners on homes, a lot of times there are mortgages. So, so the okay. additional insured is going to show the mortgagee. So it's your responsibility, the trust officer's responsibility, to explain, well, there could be a mortgage, of course, on the property, but right. in this case, who want the trust to be named as the additional insured. Okay. So I have two follow-up questions. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. No, I, I uh, wanted to. I hope that answered the question. Um, so two follow-up questions. Um, one, some carriers, the one question is some carriers are reluctant to add the trust as additional insured. If the trust is listed as quote-unquote interested party, is that enough? I really don't know. I could certainly okay. check on that, but I would certainly ask the insurance broker on that question who's, who's writing the insurance on that property. I don't understand who an in, how a trust would be an interested an interested right. party if they weren't owning the property or, you know, the title was in the name of the trust. Okay, so well, here's I could, a follow-up then. That. Okay. Here's a follow-up. We've been told that being named additional insured as opposed to the named insured reduces their claim to any settlement money due after an insurance claim is filed. Is there any truth to that? Honestly, I, you know, that's where the fine print probably comes in. But right. I should, but I also want to talk to the insurance broker to get a really good talk in my language. What does that mean when I, when you're saying, well, you might be denying claim. I would, I'll always ask a lot of questions. I don't have a problem asking questions in that respect. So I'm sorry I can't really answer that. I, I go to the people who need to be able to answer those questions. Okay. Well, I think Chad, I, and I'm getting these relayed to me, I think Chad might have the people ask, so maybe we'll just follow up that way. Well, listen, Judy, um, that's all the questions we have. But i got to tell you, I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I, uh, I thought that was a great presentation, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time today, and I'm Appreciate everybody uh, dialing in and taking part in the presentation today. So, uh, Judy, thank you again very, very much for taking part. And we'll see everyone at the uh, next session in, in a couple of weeks. Thanks again, Judy. I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed doing it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.